want to continue where I left off last week on desire, on the subject of desire. And uh, actually, I'm going to even take it another week until next week as well. There's still something that I'm not even including today. I'm going to save it till next week. So I trust that you'll continue to just grab a hold of what God's wanting to say. Here's really what it comes down to. The Lord just put on my heart that as a pastor, as a church, that, um, you know, even though this is probably very elementary or maybe repetitive that you've probably heard within your Christian walk, you know, this year it seems like God just impressed my heart to say, let's be encouraged to draw closer to Him. I know you probably would hear that every year from every church, and you know, but let's take this really serious, amen? Jesus really is coming soon. You know, the Bible talks about even there were scoffers in that day of the, uh, the disciples, the apostles, the early church. There were scoffers, and they made fun of them. They said, you know, where's this Jesus that you've been talking about? You know, it's, the things haven't changed. Because really, if you think about it, the disciples are really expecting Jesus to come back within their lifetime, within their time period. You know, when I got saved back in the early 70s, as a teenager, I was expecting Jesus, you know, man, I mean, they just rocked my world with, they told me Jesus is coming soon, amen, and, and, uh, and so I finally came to know the Lord, but man, I was so excited about what Jesus had done in my life in the early 70s and through the mid-70s, I should say that I was telling my friends in junior high and high school, Jesus is coming, you know, I was all about, do you remember the peachy folders? Peachy folders? Do they still sell those? Okay, well, I remember on the peachy folders, uh, so you guys are looking at me like, what is that? You still have one. Just goes to show you how old she is, amen. <laughs> but I used to write, I used to draw on my peachy folder all over it. I think you all did. For those of you that know what I'm talking about, we used to write all over it. And I, I had one-way signs, you know, one way, Jesus. And Jesus is coming soon. Big bubble letters. This was the 1970s, Amen. And I was really thinking he was coming back within that short time. And here I am, after getting saved, I've been walking with the Lord 48 years already, I think. It's been 48 years. And he hasn't come yet. And so during the time of the disciples, because they were getting martyred and they were getting killed off, and the Bible talks about how scoffers were making fun of them, saying, where is this Jesus you've been talking about? Listen, he's coming. He's coming. He's coming soon. And I think you could testify with me that we're living in a world right now that we've never seen before. Amen. Amen. Some of you in this room are already in your 80s, mid-80s. And if I was to ask you, have you ever been in a, in a, in a world like this, in, a, in what we've been looking at, uh, been living through? And, and, and I would say no. And so here God is just encouraging us as we start off the year of 2022 to have a greater desire for him. And one of the things I shared last week is that desire is a good thing. I'll be talking about bad desire next week, but desire is a good thing because one of the things, and just to recap just briefly from last week for those of you that weren't here, desire is God-given. God gave us desire because God has desire. We talked about the desire God has. And God does desire and want us. He longs for us. That's what we talked about last week. And I just want to make clear that this way, those of you that are here for the first time, desire is not only from God and comes from God, but God wants that desire that he's in place within us to be turned on, awakened for him. Because God's desire for you, he loves you. He, he longs to have fellowship with you. You see, this is his heart. And because of that, I can actually say when I said last week, desire to make it in really easy terms, it's wanting. It's simply wanting. And, and we have to ask ourselves, what is it we want? You see, God wants you. God longs for you. You see. And if God wants you, he wants you to know that when Jesus came on the scene, Jesus wants you. Jesus loves you and wants you so bad. I mean, you know, I started asking God, I said, you know, I know that there's in the word, where is it that we can really know clearly that Jesus wants us with that same desire that God had from the very beginning because Jesus was there. We read that in Genesis. And here's what Jesus said. He told his disciples 
as he was, they were questioning him, he said in John 14, 9, he who has seen me has seen the Father. So here we see that Jesus has that same desire and longing for you. One of the things that his, he lamented over Jerusalem because it just hurts his heart. It hurt his heart when he said these words in Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who, stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted, you see, there's the desire, the, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but yet you were not willing. Jesus longs to have fellowship with you. Jesus longs, he wants to protect you, to bless you, to have relationship with you. This is the word of God and this is the heart of Jesus because Jesus has the heart of the Father. We sang that song today, the heart, you know, having the heart of the Father. Jesus definitely has the heart of the Father. And Jesus, just like God, the Father, desires to have fellowship and have a relationship with you. Don't take that lightly. Don't take that lightly. When Jesus walked with his disciples and we talk about his desire, you know, he already prepared them. He was warning them of what was to come. Well, the time came for Jesus to die, even though the disciples didn't fully understand that. But yet he says in these words, and once again, we see the heart of Jesus in Luke chapter 22. I'm going to turn there. In Luke chapter 22, beginning at verse um, 14, here's what it says. When the hour had come, he sat down with the 12 apostles with him. And then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus here says to his disciples, I couldn't wait. I longed for us to have this meal. Jesus knew what was going to be taking place in the early morning of those hours when he would be arrested. But he said to the disciples on that night before he was arrested, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat with you this Passover. With fervent desire. You see, Jesus longs to just be able to dine with you. Now, spiritually, we can use, and, and even as we see this, Jesus still desires to sit and dine with you and eat with you. We know not in the physical anymore, for God is spiritual. Jesus is by the Holy Spirit. He's still present with us, but it's spiritually. One of the things that he said in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone, he says, if anyone, I love the encouragement we heard from our men's breakfast yesterday. Brother Ben brought a powerful word to the men. And one of the things he says, and I want to repeat it, he says, you know what? Even if you were the only one, Jesus would still have died for you. Even if you were the only one. Jesus says here in this verse, uh, verse 20 of chapter 3, he says, if anyone, just one, anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and what? Dine with him and he with me. Do you see the intimacy of Christ? The intimacy of Christ is that he longs to sit and dine with you if we'll just open up that door of our lives. If we'll just open up that door. He's knocking, but you've got to be the one who opens that door and says, come on in, Jesus. Come on in. And so when we're not born again and we're not saved, we say to him, Lord, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I want to give you my life. Come on in. And Jesus will come in. But as believers, we can still take this invitation. This invitation where Jesus says, because listen, I shared with us last week, so many of us, sometimes we backslide. So many of us get lukewarm. So many of us get just disconnected from God. And Jesus is knocking. When are you going to spend time with me again? When are we going to sit and dine with each other? We've got to open that again in our hearts. And say, Jesus, come on in. Let's sit and dine. Gee, I love it because in this verse 20, he says, if you'll open that door, watch what I'll do. I'm going to come in and I want to sit with you and I'm going to dine with you. 
and you with me. You see, there's something special about dining with someone. There's something special about breaking bread with someone. There's something that supernaturally takes place. There's a connection that happens. There's a relationship that happens. There's, a, there's just some form of bonding that takes place when you have a meal with someone. Are you hearing me? You see, you may not know somebody and, and all of a sudden you just sit down together and you have a meal, you get to know one another, you leave that meal and say, man, that was pretty good. It wasn't that the meal was good, it was that the connection, the bonding that took place spiritually, something happens when you have a meal with someone. And you see, Jesus is simply saying, why aren't we eating together anymore? Do you not desire me? Are you not desiring what I have to give you? Are you not hungering or thirsting for me anymore? You see, that's why this year the Lord just put on my heart, let's start off right. Let's start off, let's start off by just having that rekindle in our hearts for Him, that longing for Him, that desire for Him, because something special will happen in you. And if you, and you know, I challenged the men yesterday, and I'm going to challenge the women likewise. Is that in the month of February, which we always look at as the month of love because of Valentine's Day and all that, you know, all that mushy stuff, right? I so, I'm so glad my wife isn't all like that. I don't, give, I don't give her flowers. I don't give her candy. I don't, no, man, no way. I just give her me. <laughs> and that's what she says. She says, I don't, you, honest to God, I'm not lying. You think I always make fun of her? Honest to God, watch. I'm going to test her right now. Alicia, am I lying? Why, this is, be honest, you're in church. Be honest. Have not you told me, I don't want candy, I don't want flowers. Tell them the truth. If you raise your hand that says, yes. Oh, wait, she has a story, okay. <laughs> wait a minute, man, this is, this, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is not... This, wait, this is not in the script, okay? I'm just telling you. Be, be nice to me. It's, it's not a bad story about him. It's really about me. Okay, great. It was Valentine's Day, and if you've been to my house, I have an item. So I was opening the newspaper, and I had my back to him coming through the front door, and I was looking at ads and what have you, and there was this big ad that said, Roses for Valentine's Day. So that was fresh on my mind. He, I hear him walk in. I said, and don't you dare buy me roses for Valentine's Day. He came like from behind me and he went like this. <laughs> went to the trash and he threw them away. He had Bobby roses and he threw them away. You see? Come here. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. All you want is me. All I want is you. Amen. See? <laughs> I'm telling you. You know I wouldn't lie to you guys, man. Come on. But Jesus longs for you. He doesn't, you know, there's an old song. An old song I remember because I go way back in my, in my walk with Jesus. These old songs never leave you. This song, Something more than gold for the master Something more than gifts to appease. There is only one thing you alone can bring. There is only one thing that will do. All he wants is you. Nothing else will do not just a part he wants all of your heart all he wants is you you know sometimes we think we have to god i want to do this and you heard joey ah oh, lord i gotta give this and i gotta do this and i gotta all he wants is you See, the rest will follow out of love for him. But all he wants is you. 
And when you think about that, God is just wanting to, us to know for sure that he desires you, that Jesus desires you and is longing to just sit and dine with you. Will you make the time to have dinner with him? And when I say dinner, it's his word is our food. Prayer is that connection, is that relationship where we just talk with Jesus. I know some of you might say, man, I just don't know how to pray. I just don't know how to, how do I do, you know, just sit there. How many times, going back to my wife, you know, when we started dating as teenagers way back in the 70s, there was times that, and you guys know this to be true because you did the same thing. You'd be on the phone and nothing is being said. <laughs> and all of a sudden somebody just goes, and, oh, what did you say, what did you say? Uh, nothing, I was just breathing, I was just breathing. <laughs> and then you don't say nothing, you're just there for hours, saying nothing. Because you don't know what to say, but yet you don't want to let go of that tone, phone call. Come on, somebody say amen, who's there, who's been there? You see, you know, I'm telling you the truth. So just hang out with Jesus. You don't know what to say and you're dining with him and you're sitting with him and you're in that place of reading the word and then you just close it. Just listen to him. Listen to him through the word. Listen to him in your spirit. You don't always have to do all the talking. Sometimes we just need to learn to shut up. Just, let, just, just be there to just hang out with Jesus. Jesus told his disciples, he says, you know, th this was a time in his life, at the morning of his, uh, right before his arrest, he says to them, let's go pray. We need to go pray. Man, I am going to be going through something. I really need your help in prayer. Just for one hour. He's, well, he didn't tell them that, but afterwards he comes and catches them sleeping three times. You know that, Lou, three times. And Jesus goes back and says, could you guys not tarry? Could you not watch just one hour? Now, some have taken that to say, spend time as an hour with Jesus. That would be awesome. You could, you should. But why don't you start with 10 minutes and then grow it to 50, to 20. You see, the more you get in love, the more you draw and desire him, the more longer you'll want to stay. And that hour won't seem, it won't seem like anything at one point in your lives. But you've got to start. So I encouraged the men yesterday, and I said, you know what, next month, in the month of February... I'm going to ask you guys to give me a name of a man that you can call every day just for a 30-second phone call. And that 30-second phone call is just going to say, hey, brother, did you read the word today? And then those two guys will tell each other every day for 21 days, just 21 days, because it's proven fact that if you can do something for 21 days, you will establish a habit. So you guys know that. Some of you have habits. Maybe I'll talk about that next week that we need a break. Amen. <laughs> but 21 days. After 21 days, you don't have to call that brother anymore unless the Lord has you do that for anybody. But what I'm trying to say is this, is that for 21 days, men, women, men will call men and women will call women. Just for 21 days, did you spend time with Jesus today? Did you read his word? That only took me 10 seconds to say. Not even. Think about it. We're here to take our walk with Jesus seriously. And we're here to encourage one another. And how bad will it be for a guy to give you a 10 second phone call? To hear his voice, no text, no text. No, a phone call, time it, time it. Here it goes. Uh, hey, Brother Jerry, Brother Jerry, Brother Jerry, wake up. Hey, did you read the word today? All right, I wanna encourage you, read the word. Boom, hang up. How long did that take? 10 seconds. Is that going to hurt you every day, 10 seconds? And for Jerry to call Larry? Do you understand what I'm saying? Is if we can do that, now that's going to be between that person and God, whether they do it or not, but at least they've been encouraged to try to establish a good habit of reading God's word, 21 days, men, women. And if we can do that, I really believe that God will increase our desires for him even in a greater way. It's a help. It's better than nothing, amen, somebody, amen? amen. 
And so if we can just encourage one another to have this greater desire for God, because Jesus has this desire, and one of the things that I want to say is this, and let me just say this. If we don't ask God to increase our desire and make the effort intentionally to desire Him, you realize, and I'll talk about this next week, is that there are desires in us, but those desires can lead us astray. So when you talk about bonding and having a meal with someone or breaking bread or just having fellowship with someone, you know that it, it, because it, there is a connection, because there is a bonding that takes place, you really need to be careful who you have meals with. And I'm talking spiritually and, and physically. You've got to really be careful who you're having meals with. And, and this could be family and this can be friends. This could be coworkers. It doesn't matter. Because one of the things that we know is that if we have a meal with someone, and if we're not strong in Jesus to influence them, they will influence us. Now, here's the great thing about Jesus, because Jesus is Jesus. You see, he didn't have a hard time because they associated Jesus with sinners. They said, man, we see you eat with sinners. We see you eating, drinking with sinners. You see, Jesus could do that because Jesus was holy and sinless. And he influenced the sinner. The sinner did not influence him. His values, his holiness, his godliness because of who he was, he was influential to those who were lost and they were amazed. But Jesus didn't do what they did, but he ate with them to win them. But I, I, I would say the only time you could do that if you're really strong with the Lord because if you're not strong in the Lord, if you're not really passionate about Jesus, you need to stay away from bad company. The Bible tells us in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, he says, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Evil company corrupts good habits. So do we stay away from evil people? Well, you might as well shut yourself in a suitcase and put yourself in a cave. There's evil people everywhere. That's not what God is saying. God is just simply saying, listen, we can win them, but you better be strong in Christ. If not, wait until you continue to develop. You don't need to keep company with evil people in the respect of having fellowship with them because in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, it says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness? God is warning you not to be equally yoked. And you know as well as I do what a yoke is. A yoke is simply what oxen pull. It is what they lock two oxen together so they could plow a field and it's like they're working together. And God is simply saying you don't need to be together with someone like that. You see, because they're going to influence you. If you're not strong in the Lord, if you're not passionate for Jesus, if, you're not, if Jesus isn't your greatest desire, their desires, their values will rub off on you. And before you know it, you will fail. You will fall if your desire for God isn't strong because those desires can easily shift. Can I say this to teenagers here this morning? Those of you that are teenagers or young adults, especially those of you that might be in the age of around 12 years old. I know that because at 12 years old, I really went crazy and wayward at, a, at an early age. The things of this world, I didn't know Jesus then. I didn't come to know Jesus until I was 14, but at 12 years old, I already started the life of drugs and drinking and girls at 12 years old. So I know what can happen, the change of your body, your whole mechanism, the whole, what do they call it? Uh, hormones starts changing you, everything starts, just your whole world starts changing. You know what I'm talking about. And, and, and if you, thank you, purity, I couldn't, I can't even say it, amen. <laughs> purity, amen. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about, amen. <laughs> And so here, what I'm trying to say is that young people, listen, very, be very careful because if you're not passionate for Jesus, those worldly friends will influence you. They will. You've got to be careful. Be careful of the unbelieving friends because they will lead you astray. Somebody say amen. amen. Here, let me continue on. John chapter 17, verse 24. Listen to Jesus' prayer. Jesus' prayer was, Father... I desire that they, now he's talking about us. This is believers. This is, 
This prayer segment in this chapter 17 isn't for the disciples. He already lifted them up in prayer to the Father, but now he's praying for all believers, which is you and I, even after 2,000 years, listen to Jesus' prayer, listen to his heart, listen to the desire of his heart. He says, Father, I desire that they, that's us, also whom you gave me may be with me where I am that they may behold my glory which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world do you hear Jesus's prayer Jesus's desire is for you and I to what be with him there's nothing greater than in his heart his desire his longing is that you and I are with him, being with him for all eternity, amen, so that we can behold his glory. That's what he wants. That's what he wants for you. He, what, we hear here, what we see here is his desire and his prayer is he says, Father, I want them to be with me. I want them to be with me so that they can experience my glory for all eternity. I don't know about you, but that's, we're, we're seeing the heart of God. We're seeing the heart of Jesus. We're seeing the desire that they have for us, amen, that he has for us, amen. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 2 and 3, here's what it says, in my Father's house. Listen, this is a promise. Jesus isn't lying. In my Father's house are many mansions, dwellings. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you see there's his desire where he said that earlier in the prayer. He says, I want you to be with me that where I am, there you may be also. That's a promise of God. That's a promise of Jesus that we go to this place called heaven. And I don't know about you, but heaven's going to be a blast. Amen. And only you can make up your mind if you're going to be there or not. Here's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. As it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Can I just, I don't think God's going to mind if I say this, but I'm going to just, just for the sake of this message, that God has prepared for those who desire him. You see, is Jesus, is, is he our greatest desire? This is really the heartbeat that God's wanting us to start with in this new year. He has something in store for us. He has prepared a place for us. We can't even imagine, you know, the old song that's been around for about 10 years, I can only imagine, I can only imagine what heaven's going to be like. Amen. Revelation chapter 21 gives us a description of heaven. If you haven't read the Bible in a long time, I'm going to read the chapter to you. Amen. Here he says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. I want you to just to put this picture in your mind's eye. A new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. You see, the desire of God is for you to be with him, of all that he's prepared. Please don't throw this away. Please don't take this minimal. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And then he who sat on the throne, and he said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. Do you desire God? He'll fill you. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, 
the abominable, the murderers, sexual and moral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me, and he talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. That's you guys. And he carried me away into the spirit, in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like the most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates. The names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. And the city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. You, you, you want to know how big heaven is? As we see the description, and I'm going to continue reading in just a moment. 12,000 furlongs are, comes to the equivalent so that we can understand 1,380 miles. Uh, Callie, do we have that image that I can put on? We have that image we can put on the screen. 1,380 miles. To give you an idea how far 1,380 miles are, there, look at that. That is approximately or more like, almost exact, what 1,380 miles looks like in every direction as a perfect cube. Touches all the way down to the lower part of the United States, all the way to the northern part of the United States, and pretty much covers almost two-thirds of perhaps a little more than half of the United States. That gives you an idea. Now, here's the interesting thing, because I'm not that smart. I had to call my genius friend to help me. And I said, well, how far, if this is what 1,380 miles is, or what did I say, 1,200? 1,300. 1300. If this is 1,380 miles in every direction from north to south and east to west, how high is 1,380 miles going up? Because we're talking about a perfect cube. Well, he told me that our satellites that are in space are 150 miles in the atmosphere, in space. 150 miles times that by 10. Do you see how big heaven is? There's room for everybody. There has been room for everybody for 6,000 years. For the billions upon billions upon billions, and right now on our world today, there's nearly 8 billion, but think about 6,000 years of people, billions upon billions upon billions throughout the 6,000 years, and there's room enough for everybody, but everybody won't go because they don't want God. They do not desire God. God desires them. God wants them. You've heard the scripture that I quote so many times in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. God is not willing that any should perish. God is patient. God is long-suffering. God is waiting. God wants people to repent. It says he is not willing that anyone should perish, but that all, all, that takes out the whole election theory. Oh, God only choose you, but you can't go. He didn't choose you. So I hope you're not a Calvinist in here this morning. So that rules that out. 
You can go, but you can't go. How would you like that? For God to say, you can't go. How would you like Jesus to be on the cross? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. I'm going to die for everyone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life if anyone comes to him. Oh, but you can't because you're not chosen. You, you can't come. How would you like that? That's not God's heart. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. There it is. People don't want to repent. People don't want to give their... They don't want to desire God because if they desire God and they, they, they choose God, and they, they don't want God because it's like, I have to what? I have to repent. I have to surrender. I have to let him be boss. No way. I'm in control of my own life. You ain't going to tell me what to do. So you got the wide road that leads to destruction, Jesus says, and many, many go in to, through the wide road of destruction to their final demise, which is, of course, the lake of fire for all eternity. But then Jesus says, but those few, they find it. Narrow is the gate, narrow is the path, and only few find it. And so you, you, you have to know do you really know Jesus? Do you really desire him? Is he number one in your life? Or he's, if he's not number one in your life, then something's wrong. And this is where we need, we need, as a believer, we need to repent. And we need to just reprioritize our life. And he's got to be number one. He's coming for a church where he's number one. Can somebody say amen? amen. I know this is not, I, I said it last week, I know this is not popular, but I'll tell you, I'm telling you in love, I love you. And so I say this, I'm going to repeat this. I, I said this scripture last week, I'm going to say it again. It's in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, then let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires, you see, there is desires in us. We already know God has desire for us, but is our desire for him? Because here's he says, whoever desires to save his life, if you desire that it's like, no, you're going to keep yourself first place, you will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, in other words, if you desire him, you will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give? in exchange for his soul. I like the way that verse 26 reads in the New Living Translation. Just Verse 26 just simply says this, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? You know, the message of repentance wasn't a popular message even 2,000 years ago. Do you realize that John the Baptist preached it? They killed him. Jesus preached it. They killed him. Peter preached it, they killed him. Paul preached it, they killed him. <laughs> you know, that's why preachers and pastors don't want to preach repentance. They don't want to die. You know how pastors and preachers today die? Not like they did 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, they really killed them. They really took their life. So if you preach repentance today, pastors that are watching, because I know pastors watch us, if you don't preach repentance, yeah, you'll live. You better be careful. But the reason why pastors and preachers don't want to preach repentance today, because they're, they'll lose people. They'll lose people. They'll lose congregations. People will say, I ain't going there no more. All he wants to talk about is holiness and godliness and living for God, living for Jesus. It's like, man, let's go somewhere else where it's like, what's in it for me? <laughs> so it doesn't bother me. You know, one of the things that I've always trusted God with with my life is that I know he'll take care of me. So it doesn't matter whether you all leave. He's still going to take care of me. I believe that. He always has. Jesus, when he was questioned, he had over 5,000 people following him. And when he says, oh, you guys want just what I gave you? Well, here, let me give you me. It's like, we don't want you. Just keep giving us the stuff. And uh, they all left. 
So if there's anybody that knows how to clean out a church, it's Jesus, amen? He knows how to empty out a church, amen? <laughs> amen. Let me uh, end here. I got two more passages of scripture. I, I want to read 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 10. Here's what it says. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with great noise and elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for the hastening of the, the hastening, the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. You know, I just realized something. I just realized that I didn't finish reading uh, Revelation. And you obviously didn't remind me. Amen. But here God is simply telling us that we see that there is something that is about to take place where everything will be destroyed. Everything. And God's going to make everything brand new. That's why I want to encourage you. Is he really your desire? My last passage of scripture is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2. It's just, it says this, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. You know, back when I first got saved, like I said, one of the popular films then that was being circulated in the movie house and in churches, gymnasiums, we even had it at our high school gymnasium. It was the old movie called The Thief in the Night. You guys remember seeing that? Many of you that go way back then. And it was a great film. You see it today and it doesn't compare to the technology today, but you know what it had? It was a powerful message and the powerful message was that Jesus is coming again. Don't be left behind. That was the message. Desire Jesus more than anything and everything that you could ever want. Just like the song we sang. You know, take me back to the simple truth, Lord. What is the simple truth? The simple truth is all I want is you. All I want is you. Are you ready to meet Jesus? Because I'll tell you, I that you're not one that says, well, he didn't come during this certain feast. We have people who believe these things and uh, they stand by it and that's up to them. But they say, oh, he didn't come during this particular feast because he's got to do it here on this feast. So therefore, and I tell them, I said, you better be careful with that because if he doesn't come in that feast that you set, then you know what? If you tell people that, then they figure they got another year to mess around. Instead of living for God, instead of desiring God, I got another year. I'll wait till we get closer to that feast. I can't remember what the name of that feast is. The Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Trumpets, I think it is, that the Jews practice, the Feast of Trumpets. Well, I'm just going to wait till we get closer to the Feast of Trumpets because that's when the trumpet's going to sound. That's when Jesus is going to take us. Listen, I tell you what, Jesus just said to his disciples and he says to us, watch and be ready every day. That's right. Just live today for him. Take me back to that simple truth. Of all I want is you. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, I believe, Lord, that your heart has been revealed through your servant here this morning. And it just comes down to this, Lord. Again, it's just another, another word of encouragement. Are you what we desire? We have seen clearly that you definitely have desire for us. You definitely have wanting, longing for us to sit and dine, to have a meal together in the Word, for you to just allow us to experience your presence, your presence of just who you are, not, not for what we want of you, but for just who you are. Take me back to that simple truth, Lord. Help me to be reminded that you love me that much. And now, Lord, everything else will fall into place. I'm reminded that you said, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first, desire the kingdom of God and righteousness. Let that be renewed in our hearts today, Lord. 
let righteousness and godliness and holiness, let that be renewed in our hearts today. We need you. I want you. And I believe many believers here today want you also, Lord. And like we prayed last week, we'll pray again. Lord, if you have taken second place in any place else but first, please forgive us, Lord. Please forgive us and restore us and restore our hearts. We want to come back to that place of desiring you, wanting you, longing for you. Help us, Lord, as we just practice getting back into your word, back into the place of prayer. Even when we don't know what to say, just that we sit there with you in that quietness and allow you to speak to us. Lord, I really believe that's what you're wanting to do in our lives today. In a moment, Lord, we're going to sing that new song again. The worship team will lead us. And let this be a time of us just drawing nearer to you, Lord. And let this be a, a prayer also, God, that all I ever need is you. And you are my miracle. You're my breakthrough. God, I trust you. Man, that's a powerful song that we learned today. We can have miracles done every day in our lives. It doesn't have to be where we wait to come to church. We can have breakthroughs in our lives every day because of you. So all I ever want is you, Lord. Would you just, just with your eyes closed, right where you are, humble in your heart before him, Humble your heart before him in the sight of the Lord. And he will touch you. He will. Right where you are, he can touch you. He can. He is here in this place. His spirit is so very real. And I believe right now somebody already is experiencing that. And you're encountering him. You see, you need to just first, if, if you're not sensing anything... Perhaps you need to repent and you need to ask God to forgive you, cleanse you, purge the iniquity, the transgression, sin. Just confess that to him. Have him cleanse you by the precious blood of Jesus. Right now, Lord, cleanse, purge. Take us back to that place where we first loved you. Take us back to our first love where we desired you, where we just couldn't wait to read, getting, couldn't wait to pray, couldn't wait to just spend time, quiet time with you. All I ever need is you. All I ever need is you. Lord, I believe you're touching and speaking into people's hearts. I believe he's doing that right now, guys. Just let him do that. That's him. That's him. Do you sense him? Do you feel his presence? It's here. It's in this house. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just take your time. Break through. Break through. Push away the distractions. Break through. Just, just talk to him. Don't, don't, don't be ashamed if you need to cry. Don't be ashamed if you just need to just say, Lord, I love you. I need you. All I ever need is you. Thank you, Lord. Give me singing to me. All I ever need is you. All I ever need is you. All I ever need is you. Bring me back to the simple. Yes. here in your heart. He's listening to you. Just keep asking him. Say, Lord, I want more of you. That's all I want. Take away the things that have led me astray. Take away those desires that are not healthy. Take away those desires that are not beneficial to my spiritual walk. And increase my desire for you, Lord. Yes. There it is. Increase my desire for you, Lord. Oh, I believe you're doing that right now, Jesus. I believe that, Jesus. I believe that, Jesus. Increase my desire. Would you just speak that out? Speak it out so your own ears can hear you, so that your own flesh can hear you, that you can crucify that 
the sinful desires and just allow the Holy Spirit to raise up a godly desire, a godly hunger, a godly thirsting for Him. And you need to just speak it out. You need to lift your voice. What do you? I hope you're not ashamed to lift your voice and say, "All I ever need is You, Lord. All I ever want is You, Lord, Jesus, Jesus. All I ever need. Sing it again. All I ever need is You. Come on, let that be your prayer. All I ever need is You. Back to the simple true. There it is, there it is. Come on, just break through. Break through. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, sing it again. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All I ever need is you. Would you just lift your hands now? Come on, let's just lift our hands and praise you. Take me back, Lord, to that simple truth of just wanting you, Lord Jesus. All I ever need is you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All I ever need is you. All I ever need is you. Let's just praise Him. If you need to come to the altar and just have a quiet time, we're not going to pray for you. But if you just want to come to the altar, feel free. The altars are open. We're not going to come and pray for you. Just come to the altar and just spend time with Jesus this morning. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
Father, thank you for such a wonderful time in your presence and with the people of God, with the people, the community of faith here at Agape. Thank you, Lord, for touching our lives today. And we trust, Lord, that you've done that in all the churches across our land as people have gathered today. Thank you so much, Lord. May this desire continue to increase every day for you. Now I pray, Lord, that you bless each and every one. And I pray, Lord, that as your word says, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.